All right, well, as I can see that sort of many participants are joining, welcome back to the day three of uh, the workshop on epidemics, opinions, and uh, misinformation. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker of the day, uh, Laura Masulier. Laura Masulier is research director at INRIA. He's head of the Microsoft Research and INRIA Joint Center. He's a professor at the Applied Math Center of Ecole Polytechnic. His research interests are in machine learning, probabilistic modeling, and algorithms for networks. He has held a research positions at France Telecom, Microsoft Research, and Thomson Technicolor, where he headed the Paris Research Lab. He received best paper awards at IEEE Infocom, ACM Sigmetrix, ACM Connext, NeurIPS. He was elected Technicolor Fellow in 2011. He received Grand Prix uh, Scientific of the Dell Duncan Foundation uh, by French Academy in 2017. He's a fellow of uh, Prairie Institute. I also understand that he is the Marco lecturer as well. And uh, personally for me, I have known Laura to uh, his uh, collection of beautiful uh, works over years in all sorts of fields uh, with the theme of, uh, uh, you know, just elegant probabilistic uh, work. And uh, I believe sort of we are in a feast to hear one such uh, more work as he sort of presents uh, his work on epidemic information propagation and communication network. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let Laura start the talk. Thank you, Dev Avrat. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll uh, uh, tell you about three distinct topics, so it will uh, be a good time to uh, take questions at uh, the junction between two topics. I'll start off by telling you about classical epidemic processes uh, on graphs, uh, namely the SIS and SIR uh, celebrated models, uh, and discuss the impact of, of a graph topological properties on the behavior of those uh, epidemics. Then I'll move on to discuss about competing epidemics on graphs motivated by uh, problems of peer-to-peer -peer communication, in particular peer-to-peer -peer live streaming. And my last part will be on uh, gossiping, uh, gossip-like communication for an, another application, namely distributed convex optimization. And as you'll see, my uh, motivating examples will be drawn rather from uh, computer networks. Uh, so my epidemics won't be about uh, uh, dangerous viruses or about uh, uh, misinformation. It, they will be mostly about data uh, uh, moving around computer networks. Um, okay, so let me start with the first topic, uh, SIS and SIR epidemics on graphs. Uh, so I'll, I'll spend most of, of my time on this part uh, discussing the susceptible infective susceptible model. Uh, so we'll consider uh, such epidemics propagating on a graph G. And uh, the uh, uh, model is uh, characterized besides uh, the graph by only two parameters. There's one uh, parameter beta, which is the infection rate. That's the rate at which one node infects a, a neighboring node, any of its neighboring nodes. And another parameter, delta, which is the rate at which uh, an infected node uh, becomes healthy again. So the nodes will alternate between healthy, uh, uh, that is susceptible and infectious uh, uh, status. And uh, uh, so, as I said, my motivating examples, I'll draw from uh, computer networks. So you might think of uh, volatile memories um, and the, the uh, being infected then would mean holding a piece of information uh, and recovering from the infection would mean having erased that piece of information. So either because your, your memory has crashed or because by a deliberate design you uh, flush your memory once in a while, uh, which you may want to do, for instance, in, in uh, sensor networks. Um, all right, so uh, if you want the uh, mathematical details about the model I'm going to discuss, this is a, a Markov process uh, and uh, the state of, of the uh, system is described by a, a collection of binary variables, one attached to each vertex of the graph and the uh, uh, 
variable xi attached to vertex i will be equal to zero if the uh, corresponding uh, vertex is in a healthy or susceptible state. It will be one if it's uh, infectious instead. And so uh, to fully describe the behavior of our system, we'll just need to uh, uh, say at which rate uh, a given vertex becomes infected, and that's the first uh, blue line. So it's beta times the number of infectious neighbors at that time. Uh, and uh, we also need the rate at which a node which was infectious becomes healthy again, and that's uh, just delta, uh, the second blue line. So uh, the long-term behavior of this process is, uh, is uh, quite simple. If you have a finite graph, you just have a disappearance of the virus after a while because uh, uh, it, it may take long, but uh, eventually all nodes will recover and so the virus will be gone and uh, uh, you'll have uh, no information left in your, in your system if you were uh, uh, modeling a, a network of volatile memories. So what we are going to be interested in rather than the long-term behavior is how long does it take for uh, the virus or the epidemics to disappear? And in particular, what is the impact of uh, the graph's topology on the time to extinction? And to do that, we'll introduce two uh, specific topological descriptors of, of a graph uh, that will uh, allow uh, 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 some understanding of, of this question. So before doing that, uh, let me show you a, an example of a grid network. So uh, each node is connected to its four neighbors it, if it's in the middle. Uh, and so here you see blue nodes uh, that are healthy nodes and red nodes that are infectious nodes. And on the right, what you get to see is the uh, number of infectious nodes over time. And uh, it does seem from this simulation that uh, uh, some kind of stationary regime is, is uh, in place and you don't quite see a, a, a drift towards zero or, or the, uh, 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 the onset of disappearance of the virus. So in the case of, of a grid network, uh, the, the behavior that we should expect has been, uh, has been characterized fully in, in a very nice paper in the 80s by Dorette et al. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's a critical ratio for the infection rate beta over the cure rate delta. And uh, above this critical uh, uh, value for this ratio, you have long survival, that is, the time to see uh, extinction uh, is going to be exponential in the number of vertices. So uh, for practical matters, you will never see the extinction. Uh, on the other hand, if this ratio is below this critical threshold, then you'll see fast extinction. That is to say, uh, in time that is logarithmic in the number of nodes, you'll see uh, extinction. So, uh, uh, drastic change in, in uh, behavior as you cross this uh, critical threshold. So what we want to see is if uh, such uh, uh, dichotomy holds more generally than on uh, this grid network. So uh, first result uh, to that end is about uh, a sufficient condi condition for fast extinction. And to uh, explain it, we, we need one topological descriptor of the graph and that is the spectral radius rho of the adjacency matrix of the graph. So this is, in other words, uh, the peron frobenius eigenvalue of this matrix. So that's the uh, largest modulus of eigenvalues of that matrix. And so uh, what we have uh, based on this spectral radius is the, the theorem below, which tells you that the time to extinction t uh, is larger than some little t with a, a probability that is uh, bounded above by n, the number of vertices times something that is exponential in t. And in front of that uh, uh, t, you have uh, uh, beta, the infection rate, times rho, the, the spectral radius, minus delta, the cure rate. So that's meaningful only if uh, this difference beta rho minus delta is negative. But if it is negative, then what you can uh, do by massaging the, uh, the uh, probabilistic bound is uh, obtain a bound on the expected time to extinction. And you'll uh, get the bound that is below uh, written as a corollary. 
namely that uh, the average time to extinction is logarithmic in the number of vertices if you if you divide properly by the uh, difference in cure rate minus uh, spectral radius times uh, infection rate. So that, that gives us one, uh, one tool to assess that uh, fast ex extinction uh, will occur uh, in time logarithmic uh, in the number of nodes. So uh, let's try to get a converse result. Uh, to that end, we'll need uh, the isoperimetric constant of a graph. And uh, the isoperimetric constant of a graph uh, this is uh, uh, related to the so-called isoperimetric ratio of sets of vertices. And these ratios, if you consider the uh, set of green vertices on my picture there, uh, this ratio is uh, uh, the division of the uh, perimeter of, of the set uh, measured by the number of edges that connect that set to the uh, rest of the, of the uh, graph. These are the red edges on the picture, divided by the volume of the set. And the volume is uh, here measured by the number of vertices in, in that set. So um, it's convenient to uh, consider an isoperimetric constant defined as the minimum over sets of a size no larger than some uh, integer m of the corresponding isoperimetric ratio. Uh, and usually when you hear about isoperimetric constants, uh, these are uh, implicitly taken for uh, parameter m that is equal to half the number of nodes in the graph, but uh, it will be useful for us to allow uh, this parameter m to take uh, other values as well. Uh, so having introduced this, we have a, a result in the converse direction. Remember we had uh, uh, condition for fast extinction that read beta rho less than delta. Uh, here we'll replace this rho spectral radius quantity by an isoperimetric constant instead. And uh, we'll uh, uh, say something about long survival of the epidemics when beta times eta, the isoperimetric constant, is larger than delta the cure rate. And so we have a, a probabilistic uh, bound, that's the theorem here, which says that uh, if beta eta is larger than delta strictly, then the probability that uh, uh, survival time times uh, the cure rate delta is uh, larger than some exponential term in M, the parameter of the isoperimetric constant, the probability of this is uh, strictly positive. And so as a consequence, we, we can, for instance, uh, get a handle over the average time to uh, extinction. And under the condition of that theorem, we, we do get at once that the average time to extinction is exponential in uh, the parameter m that we have chosen for our, our uh, isoperimetric constant if we scale uh, the time properly by the parameter delta. So this, this is not a converse of the previous result, but it turns out that in many cases, this is almost a converse. And this is what I want to illustrate on a couple of examples now. So the simplest possible example is the complete graph for which we, uh, we have a, a complete understanding of what the uh, isoperimetric constant and the spectral radius are. So rho is n minus one for the complete graph on n nodes and eta m is just n minus m. And based on that, if we now apply the two previous results, we get that uh, as uh, beta over delta crosses the critical value one over n minus one here, then uh, the uh, time to extinction goes from uh, logarithmic in n to exponential in n. So we have exactly the same behavior as the one uh, I had uh, described for the grid network. So one more example to see that uh, uh, these results are, are versatile. Uh, that's the example of a hypercube graph. That's a case for which we also know quite well uh, the isoperimetric constants uh, and the spectral radius. So here we have a hypergraph of dimension d. So we have two to the D uh, nodes. Uh, spectral radius is the uh, number of neighbors of each node in this graph, and that's precisely D. And uh, uh, for uh, parameter M for isoperimetric constant, which is chosen to be uh, two to the K, then we know that the uh, 
corresponding isoperimetric constant is at least d minus k. And so again, if you, if you apply those two results, uh, you get uh, that there is a sharp transition as beta over delta crosses uh, the uh, critical threshold one over d, the dimension of that, uh, of that uh, hypercube, and you go from uh, logarithmic time to extinction to something that is exponential not in the number of nodes, but in a small power of that number of nodes. So it's not as drastic as in the complete graph, but still it's, it's a, a quite abrupt uh, transition uh, nevertheless. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish on the SIS by just saying that uh, uh, we can apply those two results on other classes of graphs and hence get a good understanding of, of uh, uh, the existence of such sharp thresholds for the behavior of uh, SIS epidemics on graphs. Uh, in particular, we, we have applied those tools on erdos renyi random graphs, the simplest possible random graphs, as well as uh, uh, the so-called power law random graphs that had been uh, proposed by uh, 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 Fan Chung and co-authors uh, uh, some time ago. So I'll say to uh, finish this first part, a few words now on uh, the SIR uh, epidemics. Uh, SIR stands for susceptible infective removed. Uh, and I'll discuss a, a very simple version of this SIR uh, process, which is sometimes uh, known as the reed frost process. Uh, it is again uh, described as uh, taking place on a graph G. And we'll have just one parameter, beta, which is the uh, probability that a node uh, being infected will succeed at infecting one of its neighbors. So uh, to be more precise, we'll have a, a, a state variable xi of t for each node uh, i in the graph, and t being now a discrete time, it will be more convenient. And so if a, a node uh, i is at time t susceptible, then it will become infected uh, uh, at the next time step with a probability that is uh, given by the fact that all of its infectious neighbors at time t will try to infect it and will succeed with probability beta. So that's the expression there. Uh, and it will remain uh, susceptible otherwise. And the other thing to, to be uh, uh, described is what happens for a node that is either uh, infected or, or removed at time t. Well, it will remain uh, removed afterwards. It's just either dead or immunized somehow. So uh, here I'll just state a result on uh, uh, a sufficient condition for small outbreak of the epidemics. And that's the theorem here. So uh, this result applies when beta times uh, the spectral radius rho of the adjacency matrix of the graph is strictly less than one. And in that case, uh, then the first uh, equation in blue holds, uh, that is to say the uh, number of nodes on average infected uh, uh, at the end will be uh, uh, upper bounded by something that happens to be sublinear in the number of nodes in the graph. So if, if you pass the uh, right hand side, you have a, a dependency as the square root of the number of nodes times the square root of the number of nodes initially infected. Uh, and the result is even more uh, uh, strong if you are uh, in the case of a regular graph in that case, you can even shave off the dependency on n altogether, and the uh, uh, average number of infected nodes in the end is going to scale linearly in the number of infected nodes initially. So no dependency on the size of the graph at all. Um, so I'll just make a comment on that result uh, since we are in uh, uh, COVID days still. So I wanted to show you uh, something that uh, those of you who have been interested in modeling COVID uh, uh, may have seen. This is the extended version of the SIR diagram for uh, uh, people affected by, by COVID. So instead of going from susceptible to infective, then to uh, uh, removed, you go through an exposed, then a prodromic, then maybe an asymptomatic phase. You may go to the hospital or not. So you get a, a, a much more intricate diagram. 
but still it makes sense to consider uh, an individual centric epidemic model where you have uh, a graph with nodes representing individuals and they can all go through the sequence of, of states in the uh, diagram I'm showing here and um, they get to infect uh, their neighbors on the graph and so uh, it is highly plausible that for this uh, uh, extended version of the reed frost model uh, you you do have a similar result to the theorem that I'm displaying here where uh, you have a, a sufficient condition for small outbreak described uh, by a, a condition on a spectral radius of, of a big matrix. Uh, however, it's uh, not as easy to get a control on the size of the outbreak in the end, but that, that's something that, that might be worth trying. So with this, uh, I'll take my first break, uh, giving you some pointers on uh, what I've just uh, described and taking questions, if any. So I have a question, but in the interest of being moderator, first I should let others ask questions. Okay. So maybe I'll ask a question then. Um, so I know you mentioned that most of your work has been looking at computer virus propagation or other things rather than epidemics, although you did mention something about um, <clears throat> human epidemics at the end. So so I, I guess uh, in, in some of the epidemic uh, talks that I've been seeing lately, so they look at a graph and at each node, there's a large population of individuals and they're infecting each other. So each node represents perhaps a city, for example, or maybe a, 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 a subdivision of a city, maybe an arrondissement. But, but then, and then, and then you, have, you have the graph represents the connections between, between, these, uh, between these nodes. And, and, uh, and then you take a large population limit where you look at the number of uh, nodes at each in each city becoming large, and then they use something like Kurtz theorem or something like that and write a differential equation model for the evolution across the graph. So somehow your results should translate to that too. So, so it's sort of a, almost a fully connected network within each node of a large number of individuals. And then there is a graph really across cities or across <laughs> subdivisions. And, and uh, you should be able to recover some parts of your result in in the limit also right i mean uh i think you 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 should be able to uh, uh to get similar results when you have this uh averaging taking place uh at the level of each node so right. this uh i i don't know they have a name for that is that uh, uh yeah, I can't think of model or a uh, mean I, field I model, maybe mean. I don't know if they got me mean field. I don't know, but uh, uh, that's definitely something we, we've been uh, uh, thinking about uh, over the last few months. And uh, okay. uh, so there's one thing I mean, if you want to um, get exactly the, the same structural result I've just described, mm -hmm. uh, this falls very nicely if you have a symmetric. Uh, symmetric interactions between the nodes mm -hmm. uh, because then you leverage uh, the spectral structure of the matrix connecting the populations. Right. Um, this is not obvious to me at this stage that uh, you can you can have that because you may ah. have uh, you know uh, age ranges matter for COVID and so you you worry about the population of a certain age range in a certain uh, 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 region and they may visit another region and it's not clear you do have the symmetry. So maybe something else need to be uh, brought to bear if you want to uh, claim that given a, a, a spectral radius condition, then you have sublinear uh, outbreak in the end. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Anil Falikanti from UVA. Uh, so, uh, um, can you say anything about uh, the large beta regime for SIR uh, when uh, beta rho is more than one? Like, are there any bounds now? Uh, for, for SIR? Um, yeah. So that was a while ago. I think we, we did not get something as nice as for the SIS. And this is, uh, uh, so we did analyze uh, special topologies, for instance, star networks 
or complete graphs. These are things you can do quite, uh, quite precisely. Uh, and so from our work on the SIS, what seemed to be the case was that uh, the uh, properties for, for oddly structured networks were dominated by a core. Uh, the, the best connected part of the, of the network. For instance, for power law random graphs, the beha behavior of SIS epidemics was dominated either by a star, uh, if you had uh, a node that had so many neighbors that it dominated, or by a, a densely connected uh, a core. So these were the two scenarios and, and we could leverage that and that would really drive what happened. I don't remember, uh, I don't think we had such a clear picture for SIR though. Uh, certainly at the time we did not find that, maybe, maybe there is, but uh, yeah, thanks. that's to, to be investigated then. Uh, maybe I, I can ask one quick question. If uh, going back to your, let's say your another work uh, 10 years later, but it was about this uh, kind of, um, um, community style model, where imagine that we have got cliques of the community and then very sparse edges between them. And uh, whether it's SIS or SIR, um, uh, would you, um, is there a different type of behavior you would expect in that setting? Because there's lots of uh, maybe epidemic starts in one place and then somehow you have a lot of growth and yeah, then yeah, after yeah. a while there is a lag growth. Uh, that's a very, very good question. So we, we have been thinking uh, uh, about that motivated by COVID. And so uh, in the long run, there is one uh, thing that seems to drive the behavior and that's the uh, spectral radius of a, uh, of a global graph. However, uh, there, there have to be other behaviors on shorter time scales where uh, things have not percolated, have not spread, so maybe some circuits that are critical to uh, uh, characterize the global spectral radius have not been activated yet. And so um, my intuition is that th th there may be very different time scales and behaviors and that the uh, theory I I'm describing here uh, looks at uh, perhaps uh, uh, the longer time scale and something else uh, would be very interesting to do on a shorter time scales. Thanks, Laura. I think we should let you continue. All right. So I'll uh, switch to uh, my second topic that is competing epidemics and peer-to-peer -peer live streaming. So our goal now is uh, to propagate uh, uh, new epidemics uh, that are created over time and that each correspond to one data packet uh, over a network. So uh, some new packets arrive at a source node of our network and our goal is to send such uh, packets over the network to all uh, receiving nodes. So that's the broadcast operation. Uh, and so imagine a, a stream, a video stream and packetized video uh, that has to be propagated to everyone. So we'll look at this in uh, two distinct scenarios. First scenario is one where uh, we have uh, bandwidth constraints on edges uh, on the network links. Uh, so these constraints characterize the number of packets that can be forwarded on a given edge per second. Uh, so our network model for this will be a directed graph with edge capacities and a, a distinguished source node. Um, and so it can be seen that the optimal rate at which you could broadcast given this network uh, corresponds to the maximal number of spanning trees that you can pack uh, in this capacitated network. And uh, on the picture on the top, I've drawn a graph where you have a unit capacity edges and you have precisely two spanning trees uh, that you can pack. So that means a, a optimal broadcast rate of two. And uh, in this definition of optimal broadcast rate, you should think of uh, packing fractional trees. So you, you could uh, put a, a spanning tree with a weight uh, one half or one third or so on. And then the uh, optimal broadcast rate is the sum of weights you assign to the uh, fractional trees. All right, so in this space, there's a celebrated theorem by uh, Jack Edmonds in 73, which says that uh, this optimal rate is the minimum of our destination nodes that are all nodes except the source in this graph 
of the max flow capacity uh, from the source to that node. And so by Ford Fulkerson's uh, max flow mean cut theorem, this corresponds to the minimum of the min minimum cut capacity between the source node and destination node. So it's sometimes referred to as the min min cut theorem because you have two minima, minimum over the receiver, then minimum over the cut between the source and that receiver. Um, so as I said, uh, uh, we have this uh, optimal broadcast rate and you could achieve uh, transmission at this uh, lambda star uh, optimal rate if you constructed uh, the uh, trees, the spanning trees that you pack uh, and then uh, the packets arriving at the source are, are directed to one or another of the trees and forwarded along the corresponding tree. Uh, that, would, that would do the job. It's not very practical because uh, if nodes depart, you have to rebuild your trees uh, all over again. So here's a, an alternative scheme, uh, which we coined the random useful packet forwarding scheme. Uh, and so this works as follows. If you have a peer A uh, about to forward one packet to a neighboring peer B, then it will assess which packets it does have that B does not yet have, the useful packets, and it will forward one uniformly chosen at random among those useful packets. So that's a local scheme and that's based on a randomized uh, uh, epidemic selection, if we call uh, packet types uh, epidemics. Uh, and so the result that we have in that space is the following. Uh, provided uh, the injection rate at the source is lambda is strictly less than the optimal rate lambda star, then uh, that scheme uh, successfully broadcasts all packets uh, with delay that is bounded in probability. Uh, so one word about how this is shown, uh, you do have a Markovian uh, probabilistic model of the operation of this protocol. And then you show that this uh, Markov process uh, has a, a long-term equilibrium, uh, 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 equilibrium behavior uh, under which the uh, packets get forwarded in, in a bounded time. Uh, and uh, you do that by exhibiting a, a so-called Lyapunov function. So one word for those uh, interested in improved techniques. Uh, you can deduce from this Lyapunov construction and from that theorem that uh, Edmond's theorem holds. And so in a sense, this is an analytical proof of uh, Edmond's theorem, whereas the original proof is completely uh, combinatorial. combinatorial. All right, so uh, one, one thing that we couldn't do on these kinds of uh, models of networks, the capacitated case, and uh, for this particular scheme is get a handle on the propagation delay. And actually the, the propagation delay was not very good. The broadcast time was not very good. So I want to tell you now about another, um, another scenario for which we can come up with a scheme that has good delay properties. Uh, so that scenario is one where uh, we have a fully connected network. So this could be uh, peers uh, that can connect to uh, each other over the internet. And uh, let's assume that they have uh, all the same uh, transmission capacity of one packet per uh, time unit. Uh, and so if you think about it, the optimal broadcast rate uh, that you can achieve in that scenario cannot be larger than n over n minus one if you have n nodes, because uh, each packet has to be uh, sent n minus n, uh, n minus one uh, times uh, because you have n minus one receivers if you bar the uh, source node and at each time you need uh, summing up the, the forwarding capacities of everyone that makes for n so uh, you cannot broadcast at, at a rate larger than n over n minus one that is roughly one another uh, uh, result that is simple to see is that uh, the uh, delay before uh, uh, a good fraction of the nodes receives a packet has to be of order uh, log to the base two of n uh, because after a packet is made available to the source, if everyone dedicates itself to forwarding that particular packet uh, in time log two of n minus one, then uh, at, at most half of the nodes will have received uh, that packet. So that, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, a bound on the delay. Uh, so let's see uh, what scheme we can propose for that. 
uh, our scheme here will be one where uh, uh, a sending peer will choose who to send to uh, uniformly at random. And uh, among the packet that it has, it will send the one that is the most recent, the latest, and that the receiver does not yet have. So that's what we call the latest useful packet selection. And so you've got the example on the, on the left of a sender who uh, uh, has packet seven, that is the latest useful packet to send to the receiver. And so on the right, you see how this behaves in practice, if you simulate it. Uh, and you see uh, uh, the first blue curve is the fraction of nodes reached by packet one, the second green curve, fraction of nodes reached by packet two and so on and so forth. Uh, each of these propagations uh, follows a nice uh, logistic curve or S curve. And uh, uh, what is uh, uh, good about this scheme is that because of the prioritization of the latest epidemics or the latest packets, it's prop the propagation of a packet is not interfered upon by uh, uh, transmissions of previous packets. So it's, it does not see such transmissions at all. It's only affected by transmissions of subsequent packets, but because of the exponential growth property, uh, this happens only very late in the dissemination of a, of a particular packet. And so thanks to this behavior that can be analyzed, uh, we could establish the, the result that I'm showing to you now. Um, so if uh, packets are uh, created at the source at some rate lambda that is strictly less than one, uh, then uh, uh, for each x, a fraction, each peer will receive a fraction one minus one over x of all packets in time order log two of n, which is optimal, plus a slack that is uh, proportional to x. So uh, put uh, crudely, this is optimal both uh, in terms of, of a, a broadcast rate it can support and uh, uh, dissemination delay. Um, so I'm about to finish the second part. Uh, as, you, as you can tell, I've mentioned uh, uh, <clears throat> random useful packet selection. I've mentioned random peer latest useful packet selection. There's a whole design space uh, here. Uh, for instance, uh, it makes sense if you have the choice between several neighbors to whom to forward, to choose the one that has uh, uh, the most packets uh, that you have that, well, to, to be the most deprived with respect to you, that is the one to whom you can send the largest number of useful packets. Uh, so that's just one example, but uh, th there's a, an interesting design space uh, there. Um, so I'll uh, pause once more, and uh, here are some pointers uh, uh, about this part, and take uh, questions if you have any. So, uh, Laura, I have one question. On, in the last slide, you had this really uh, interesting uh, result, which says that if I want to get within, let's say, epsilon frac, one minus epsilon of uh, all packets, I need order one over epsilon time to wait. Right, right. Um, and uh, clearly, if, uh, if one were to code on top of this, suppose hypothetically, would that sort of lead to sort of reduction in the delay that is, it won't scale like one over epsilon, but maybe with a little bit of uh, pre-processing, it could be reduced to, scale like order one over epsilon or log one over epsilon or something? Uh, so we, we have not done the analysis, but we, we have been thinking a lot at the time uh, at uh, using source coding. So uh, that, that's what you're talking about, right? It's uh, yeah. having uh, windows of packets then uh, and doing uh, uh, source coding to have more packets to forward, but the receivers can uh, decode the whole window by, if they receive sufficiently many out of them. I think a naive analysis uh, does not give you the improvement you, you mentioned from uh, 1 over epsilon to log 1 over epsilon, but that's maybe uh, our analytical tools. Um, I, I would not bet that it cannot be done, but uh, that, that might be quite hard. Okay. All right, shall I move on to the last part? Yes, I think so, thanks. Okay, so uh, now we are going to discuss distributed optimization. So the setup is that we have a, a network model that has a graph as usual. 
And to each node i uh, of this graph, we attach a function f sub i from uh, uh, d dimensional vectors to the reals. Um, and so uh, each of the nodes uh, can do two things it can compute gradients of uh, the function that it's uh, in charge of, for instance, and it can communicate with its uh, neighboring nodes. Uh, the aim in that, uh, in that part would be to find a minimizer of a function f of x, which is the sum of the individual functions. And we want to do that uh, in a short amount of time. So we want to manage now two uh, kinds of, of resources. There's a communication as before, but now we also have a computation resource. Um, so this is a problem that is uh, uh, quite relevant to uh, modern large scale machine learning where each function would correspond to a, a set of uh, a subset of a whole data set. And if you uh, distribute your, your data set over, over uh, uh, say, a cluster or a, a, a data center, then uh, you, you hit this kind of problem. So uh, other uh, special cases that are not necessarily related to machine learning had been considered earlier in the uh, networking literature. In particular, uh, if you take a quadratic function f sub i of x, that's the square of the norm of uh, x minus theta i, a vector held by node i, then uh, you can do the maths. The optimum is at theta star, which is the average of the vectors theta i. Uh, and that's something that's been studied a lot uh, under the name of uh, various names. Network averaging, uh, gossiping uh, in particular has been used. Um, even more special uh, cases when uh, uh, thetas are scalars and uh, uh, you initialize uh, your optimization problem with everyone taking value zero and someone saying, uh, I'm going to start with value one and let's, uh, let's run this. Uh, by the end, when all nodes have computed the optimal value, then they'll all have one over n where n is the number of nodes. And so everyone can take the reciprocal of that and get an estimate of the, of the network size. So that, that's something that's been considered as well. Um, so uh, we'll assume some synchronous operations. We'll have a discrete time step, a discrete steps t. Uh, and uh, we'll assume nodes can compute a gradient in tau compute uh, time units and they can communicate with their neighbor, do one uh, step of communication in tau communication uh, time units. So that, that's the setup. Um, and so uh, a bit more details about how uh, communication will be modeled here. Uh, basically a communication step will be such that each node can receive a linear combina combination of vectors held by its neighboring nodes. Uh, and we'll uh, use matrix W for taking those linear combinations. And W will be what's uh, often referred to as a gossip matrix. And uh, uh, the, the precise assumptions we make on this matrix are that it's a, a semi-definite positive, that its null space is exactly the constant vectors, and that uh, its non-zero entries are only for couples i, j, such that the edge i, j is indeed a, a communication edge in our communication graph. Um, so uh, more concretely, the, the two matrices people uh, typically consider are the following ones for, for doing this. Uh, these are Laplacian matrices uh, uh, associated with a graph. So the first one on the left is the uh, classical uh, unweighted Laplacian of a graph. So uh, if you apply a vector x to the left and to the right of the symmetric matrix, what it amounts to is a sum over edges uh, in the graph of the uh, squared difference of the values xi and xj at the endpoints of the edge. Uh, and there is uh, um, what's called the random walk Laplacian sometimes. Uh, there's a, uh, the version on the right where uh, you rescale the quantities xi and xj by a square root of the degree of the corresponding nodes. 
so these are the two uh, matrices you might think of as a, as a gossip matrices for this, uh, this setup. Uh, we'll need one notion for our gossip matrix. Uh, uh, we'll need to define the so-called condition number uh, of the matrix W. And for us, that will be the ratio of the uh, largest to the smallest non-null eigenvalue uh, of, this, of this matrix. So kappa com is lambda n, the largest value, divided by lambda 2, uh, the second smallest eigenvalue, which is non-zero uh, by... Uh, uh, by assumption. Uh, let's make now uh, technical assumptions on the functions f sub i, uh, the sum of which we, we uh, want to minimize. Uh, so we'll assume they are convex. And uh, uh, more than that, we'll assume that if you, if you consider the Hessian of, that, uh, of these functions, so uh, the, second, the matrix of second derivatives of, of uh, the f sub i, then uh, the corresponding matrix is upper and lower bounded by multiple of the identity. Uh, and uh, so uh, for such, uh, such functions, we define the associated uh, condition number as the ratio of the parameter beta to the parameter alpha. So this is a classical quantity uh, considered in uh, convex optimization. All right. Uh, so to get going, we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, spell out a dual formulation for our original uh, optimization problem. So it's convenient first to rewrite the optimization problem as one where instead of uh, optimizing over a single vector, we optimize over a collection of vectors, one for each node, each node and uh, we arrange them uh, x1 to xn in a matrix. And so we uh, consider the function f applied to this collection of vectors uh, that gives the sum over the vertices i of f sub i of the corresponding vector x sub i. And uh, with this notation at hand, then what we are uh, trying to achieve is uh, the minimum of this function f over matrices x such that multiplied by a uh, square root of the gossip matrix, you get zero. Uh, why is that equivalent? Well, because since the null space of W is precisely the uh, uh, space of constant vectors, this con condition precisely means uh, the vectors x1 through xn are all equal. So this is indeed uh, the same optimization problem. So we can take the dual of that um, and we get something that uh, reads like that. It's the maximum of uh, the uh, opposite of the Finchel Legendre conjugate of uh, this big function f uh, applied to a matrix of vectors lambda times the square root of this gossip matrix w. So I'm not going to uh, uh, define Finchel Legendre conjugate for you. I, let's just say that uh, in that particular case, uh, this is a function that uh, uh, separates as a sum of functions of uh, individual vectors each attached to a, a single vertex of the graph. All right, uh, uh, one thing to remark once you have made these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, definitions and define the dual problem uh, is that the function that we are now about to uh, minimize having introduced the dual, this G function, which is F star of uh, matrix y times uh, uh, square root of w uh, has a condition number uh, that is related to the two condition numbers I've introduced, the uh, computational one and the communication one. Namely, this function g has a condition number that is uh, no larger than the product of the uh, previous two condition numbers. Uh, okay, so the, the first uh, most basic thing you can do to uh, optimize such a convex function is to uh, proceed with a gradient descent. And this is what I, I've just uh, shown here on the slide. And uh, you can massage that a bit to make it a bit nicer and to make it fit uh, a bit better in the uh, communication model I've described. And so you do that by uh, uh, one step of uh, a variable change. If you, if you uh, change your variables, your vectors that you're managing by uh, post multiplying them by the square root of the gossip matrix, 
then you get a much uh, nicer looking uh, formula for gradient descent, which factorizes. Um, so for instance, you have that uh, uh, gradient descent step with this parameterization amounts to, for node i, uh, update its vector y i uh, at time t plus one by subtracting from its vector at time t uh, a linear combination of gradients evaluated uh, at its neighboring nodes. So it's, uh, it's exactly what you would want to do. And so it involves the W matrix and it's, uh, it's something that you can implement uh, easily. Uh, and so uh, applying standard uh, uh, theory of uh, uh, convex optimization, uh, you get that uh, this gradient descent if done properly, that is with a, 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 an adequate uh, gain uh, parameter eta, in T steps, it reduces the error by a factor that is exponential in the number of steps T rescaled by the uh, condition number kappa of the problem. So if we, uh, if we translate that into real time, uh, T time steps, uh, T steps means in real time T times tau comp plus tau com. And so we see that we can achieve precision epsilon in time that is order log of one over epsilon, the precision, times the condition number kappa times the sum of compute and uh, communicate times. All right, but let's see how we can uh, uh, improve upon that and eventually get at something that is, uh, uh, that is optimal. So first uh, uh, improvement that is uh, the celebrated Nesterov acceleration. Uh, you can do better by uh, maintaining not just one sequence at each node, but instead two sequences. And so uh, now uh, node i maintains vector xi of t and yi of t. Uh, first update is uh, <coughs> writing for yi of t plus one, the expression we had for xi of t plus one in the basic scheme. And now to update xi of t, uh, we, <coughs> we take um, yi of t plus one, so that would be the previous scheme, except that we add an inertia, uh, inertia term, mu times yi of t plus one minus yi of t, uh, that, uh, uh, gives a consistency in, in the in the uh, in the update uh, and if you tweak the two parameters of this scheme uh, properly then you get the same kind of result as before except that you have uh, taken the square root of the condition number instead of uh, of the uh, original condition number so i've replaced here the uh, global condition number by the product of uh, communication and computation condi uh, condition numbers. And this is what you get. And uh, if you forget about the, the fact that we are dealing with distributed optimization, uh, this tends to be optimal, the square root behavior in terms of the condition number. All right, so we'll do one more uh, improvement and get to an optimal algorithm in our distributed setup. So this uh, uh, improvement amounts to uh, uh, modify our communication step. Now, instead of doing one multiplication by this gossip matrix W, uh, we'll allow ourselves to do more than one uh, communication step per compute step, uh, and uh, we'll allow uh, ourselves to take uh, K uh, communication steps and by doing uh, successive multiplications by this matrix W, what we can arrange is to transform our input vectors, not just by multiplication of W, but my, by multiplication of a polynomial of this matrix uh, W. Uh, and uh, we'll choose carefully our polynomial uh, P sub K, and we'll uh, use for P sub K a polynomial that is defined in terms of uh, the celebrated Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, so these are uh, polynomials that are uh, uh, well known and well used in numerical analysis. Uh, they have uh, many very nice properties. For one, uh, they are defined recursively so that if you really want to do uh, this scheme, uh, you don't need to store the polynomials. You can uh, use a simple recursion instead. Uh, and uh, the key property for us is, is the next one that you can see now, uh, which says the following. If uh, we take a number of steps K, 
so a degree of the Chebyshev polynomial k uh, as the square root of the uh, condition number kappa of the original W matrix. Uh, then computing now the uh, condition number of the modified gossip matrix, we uh, have reduced that from the original kappa com to something that is of order one. So if we plug that in the previous result, we get the following uh, theorem. Um, so we assume now that uh, the uh, gossip matrix is uh, PK of W. So the time to do uh, one step is uh, changed from tau comp plus tau com to tau comp plus uh, square root of kappa com times tau com. But we have also changed the uh, condition number of our our problem on the prefactor square root of kappa, we have shaved a term a square root of kappa com. So this may not uh, be a big deal. Uh, the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about this is that you cannot beat such uh, dependency on the various uh, parameters of the problem unless you consider uh, uh, additional structure. Uh, uh, put more, more clearly, uh, we can cook up networks and functions on which uh, gradient-based schemes will never be able to converge to a precision epsilon in a time that is uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, smaller than uh, the time of this particular algorithm. So this, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I've got uh, a bunch of pointers on this last topic. So we, we've studied uh, many variants uh, and I'm happy to discuss uh, uh, any of these. All right, that's an uh, excellent uh, talk on uh, uh, three different but very closely related topic. Uh, uh, we still have a few minutes, maybe. So if there are a few burning questions, it's a great time to ask a question to Laurent. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Hey, hey Laurent, uh, this is Lei here. Uh, so for the last part you are uh, talking about, I'm just curious. So uh, here you assume each node have the access to the, uh, the entire the D-dimensional state and also the D-dimensional gradient as well. What happens if the node can only access a subset of that, like a subset of state and also a subset of a gradient as well? Uh, that's one direction we have not looked at. So I, I'm afraid I cannot uh, make a smart uh, comment on that. Uh, um, so, but I guess for, you're, you're thinking of uh, training deep neural networks or right, this kind of models where the, the dimension network. is huge. Okay, so you you, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you distribute the parameters, and not just the data. Right, right. Uh, that's a very good question, but uh, I, I have no uh, no comment to make at this stage. So that okay. was on, on our list of things that uh, that uh, would be very interesting to look at, but we have not yet. Sure. Thanks. Uh, we are exactly at the top of the hour, so um, maybe uh, in virtual way. Uh, thank you, Laura, uh, for again uh, a lovely talk. And uh, as far as uh, the workshop is concerned, we'll take a break for thirty minutes and then come back here in the same place and then start with the next speaker.